In today's video, we're going to talk about how to shoot a panorama photograph for your landscape photography. Okay, so I'm out here in the Tucson desert, uh, essentially the foothills of the Catalinas, an area called Sabino Canyon. And I'm currently out of breath, making my way up to a ridge where I hope to be able to demonstrate some panorama photography. Talk about why you'd want to do it, some tips on how to do it, and sort of walk through the process with that. So my hope is, once I'm up on this ridge, I'll get some scenic views into the canyons. Got some clouds today, a lot of clouds actually, I would call it overcast. And that's actually gonna work out good. I'm up here at sunrise, so I'm not gonna get a lot of sunrise color but the clouds and atmosphere are interesting enough for the purpose of this video. So we're gonna walk on up here. And once I find a spot, we'll get set up. And I think I'm hoping once I get up there, I'll get some views to open up. So hopefully we'll see you in a few minutes. So we're at this scene and I, that I think work for a panorama. Essentially what I am, I've made it up on this ridge a little bit and I've got sort of an overlook that's not obstructed by any messy foreground per se. And I got some clouds moving in over the opposite wall of Sabino Canyon. So I think this will work for the demo. It's got a nice little possibility to come from over here to the right, to the left, uh, towards the city. So I think it should work out pretty cool for the purposes of this demonstration. Why a panorama? So on this trip, I mentioned in another video, I came with one lens, a 24 to 200. And obviously that's not the widest lens. And in that video, I mentioned, if I see a scene that I want to photograph wider, I can always do a panorama. But what does that mean? Why would I want to do it? How does it work? And how do you shoot one? With a 24 to 200, this scene right out here is pretty wide. It's much wider than a 24 to 200 can shoot. I can only get 24 millimeters. I can only get it in chunks. And I sort of want the whole scene. I got this little ridge coming down here from the right. Got it opening up to the city over here. So because of that, I can use a panorama. What I can do is I can take multiple photos of the scene and then merge them together later in software. So I can take my 24 millimeter lens and get my slices of the image, the much wider image, pull them together in Lightroom and get a much wider image. Now there's some other advantages to panoramas too. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure my 14 millimeter lens would grab this whole scene the way I want either. And what do I mean by that? Well, one, it might not be quite wide enough. And two, on a wide angle lens, when you get to those edges, you start to get some distortion. So I might start to get some distortion here in the edges for a scene that I sort of want edge to edge quality. So that's another situation where even though your wide angle lens might capture the scene, that you want to get those slices because you'll have less distortion with a slightly longer focal length and you can work your way through the image. So that's one reason. Additionally, image quality. If I'm shooting multiple images and stitching them together, I end up with a much higher resolution photo, which could potentially open up the print sizes significantly. Now, this particular image I'm using more for demo. This is probably not going to be a great print-worthy image. I hope it'll be at least interesting, but it's mainly for demonstration purposes. But you learn this technique if you find yourself in that position where you want that huge panorama, like something like the Grand Canyon or something like that, get those big, huge scenes, you'll know how to do it and work through there. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to do a panorama of a scene that you're photographing. They're fun. They can give you an interesting perspective. So it, it's worth learning. It just It's another tool in the toolbox. Probably don't want to use it all the time, but it's nice to know that you can use it when you need it. So let's uh, drop down here just a touch and let's talk through some tips on capturing a panorama, some things you want to know before you set up the camera and it'll help influence the camera technique you use to capture that panorama so that you have more success merging together in Lightroom. Okay, I have seven tips for capturing panorama. It's not that hard. These are just some real basic tips. If you sort of form this mental checklist or even make a checklist on your notes app before you set up, it'll help just give you a better chance of getting a nicely stitched together image. First tip, I like to use a tripod. It gives me a stable base, lets me help align my camera so that everything moves nice and smooth through the scene. Now, you don't have to shoot with a tripod. I drink way too much coffee. You've heard me talk about in other videos that I, I'm probably too shaky and not stable enough, but a lot of you younger folks or people more stable handheld can actually pull it 
off handheld. You'll probably lose some pixels because your camera is inevitably going to shift some as you do it, but you can still pull it off and there's people that shoot uh, handheld panoramas. It can be a really useful tool and worth practicing. But for me, when given the option, I will use a tripod for my panoramas. Tip number two, Make sure your tripod, your camera is level on top of your tripod. Again, it's all about alignment because you're going to be rotating your camera and you want to sort of sweep it in an aligned motion through the scene. And keeping things level helps a lot. You can get a leveling ball head or a leveling tripod head, which is where even if your tripod is a little crooked, you can still level your camera without having to adjust the legs. I do not have one of those. I don't shoot that many panoramas. So if I have to level my tripod, I have to make little micro adjustments to the legs. Inconvenient, not impossible. And I just use the bubble levels on my tripod and on my ball head to sort of make sure I try to get things as lined up as possible. So keep things level. Next comes your camera exposure. This is a case where you do want to use manual mode if at all possible. You want to keep that exposure consistent between the frames. I recommend trying to move through those frames relatively quickly so the light's not changing too much, but use your manual settings to, to work through it. So the other piece of this is when you're setting your exposure, look for the brightest part of your scene. In this scene, it's brightest off towards the Southwest and in that direction it's bright. So when I set my exposure, I'm gonna want my camera pointing more towards that way because I don't wanna blow out my highlights. I wanna keep those highlights intact. And then over here where it's a little darker, I do wanna make sure I'm not completely blocking up those shadows, but generally the camera, at least the Nikon Z7 II, it's a little easier to bring those shadows up if I need to, so I'm not as concerned about that. So expose for the highlights, use manual settings because you don't want that changing through the scene. Next up, focus. This one's important um, and a lot of people don't think about it, but you wanna get your focus set at a focal point that remains the same through each of your images. So if you're taking six or seven images, you wanna start with your first image, get a focus off in the distance where you think is appropriate, making sure you've got your foreground sharp and your background sharp. Then work through your scene and don't change that focus. So I use back button focus. And what that means is I press the button and I get my focus, I let go. And my camera's not gonna to try to get focus again until I press the back button again, because I don't have it timed with a half shutter click. So I'm not gonna mess up my focus. I can get my focus, back button focus, let go. And as long as I don't touch that button again, my focal point's gonna stay equidistant through each one of my shots. The other option is, is you could use a manually focusing lens, in which case you're manually focusing anyways, get your manual focus and don't change it through any of your shots. Or use your autofocus system and in click your lens over to manual focus or set it to manual focus so that it doesn't change through there. But keep that focus the same throughout because you don't want parts of your foreground being a little more or less in focus. It's not necessarily that your foreground is going to be perfect tack sharp all the time per se, but you want to, if it's a touch off, he wants to be a touch off through the whole thing or it's visually disconcerting. So just make sure you keep that focus point the same through each of the images. Next up, White balance, make sure you have a manual white balance. Again, sometimes as you're working through a scene, your camera is gonna look at something and interpret the white balance slightly different and it'll shift it a few hundred degrees here or there. And you don't really want that happening when you're stitching multiple images together because then you're gonna have one of your images that's getting merged together, a different white balance than the others. So set a manual white balance. I tend to manually shoot at 5,500, 5,600K anyways, as long as you're shooting raw, which is highly recommended, you can always change it later. So again, Set a manual white balance as you're working through because you don't want it changing across the course of multiple pictures. Okay, panoramas have two different orientations. They have a horizontal orientation when you're shooting wide, and they have a vertical orientation when you're shooting up like that. Today, we're gonna demonstrate a horizontal panorama. So we're gonna sort of work the scene and it's gonna be a much wider landscape image than it is tall. If I was shooting a vertical, it would be more from the foreground on the way up. So maybe a super tall waterfall or something like that works really well for a vertical panorama. This scene where I'm trying to get the clouds moving through this wide canyon, I'm trying to do a horizontal. Now that influences how you wanna orient your camera. For a horizontal one, you wanna put your camera on vertically so you work through that frame. That's giving you a nice tall frame, lots of pixels to work with, and give you nice high quality through the whole frame. If you're shooting a vertical panorama, like this, then what you want to do is orient your camera horizontal and then work your way up like this. And that gives you your increased field of view vertically. So pay attention to how you orient your camera. And finally, like we said, a panorama is multiple images that you're going to merge together. So you want to be conscious of how much you overlap. You need to put enough overlap in there that the software, Lightroom is what we're going to demonstrate, has enough information to blend those, merge those together. General rule of thumb is about a 30% overlap. So you want to take your picture, move the camera so there's still 30% overlap over here, move it again, keep 30% overlap, and do that through your whole scene, whether that be six images, seven images, 10 images, make sure you get that 30% overlap. So today we're just gonna demonstrate one 
row of images. We're going to keep it pretty simple. But as you get more advanced, you can actually do multiple rows. So you can do a row down through here. You can do a row through the middle, do a row through the top. And then you have multiple merging going on. In all cases, you want to keep about that 30% overlap. That'll help you have the most success in Lightroom. And I just sort of eyeball it, you know, and try to get it close. But keeping your head about a 30% overlap should work. So that may seem like a whole lot to remember. And it's really just those are things that'll help you have the higher chance of success at the end. I've messed this up before. I've done panoramas where my camera wasn't quite level. I've done panoramas where I didn't get my 30% overlap. And the software is pretty good at piecing together. You do want to pay pretty close attention to that overlap though, because if you miss that too much, you're going to have this one fuzzy section of your image. So do try to pay attention to that. But even if you sort of mess it up out in the field, give it a whirl anyways. Lightroom's been pretty impressive how it can merge things together for the most part. And I've had pretty good success, even though I haven't hit every single tip just right. Let's jump behind the camera. Let's shoot this panorama and uh, we'll walk through that process. And then we'll take these back home and uh, merge them together in Lightroom. Okay, so now we're behind the camera to demonstrate doing the panorama. And we've got the tripod set up here. I used the bubble levels on it to get it level. I'm doing a horizontal panorama, as in I'm trying to capture these clouds moving through this canyon here and just sort of this whole scene. So because of that, it's a horizontal panorama. To maximize my pixels, I got my camera set vertical and I'm gonna pan through. I'm gonna start over here at the right and I'm gonna move it all the way through the scene. Just to maximize the pixels, I'm going to shoot further to the right than maybe what I have in my head for the composition, just so that I have the image in there to get merged together, and then I can crop and make adjustments later. I've set my camera up for, with manual camera settings, I'm shooting at ISO 400, just because it's a little dark, I wanted to keep my shutter speed up just a little bit. Aperture F8, it's sort of off in the distance, I should have plenty of focal distance. If I was being super meticulous, I would probably do a little closer check to make sure I'm dialed in aperture-wise, but for purposes of demonstration, I think f is going to work just fine with this lens and this give me a nice sharp image for the 24 to 200 that I'm using. Shutter speed 1 100th. Like I said, I wanted to just sort of keep it up so I can sort of move through the panorama somewhat quickly. Reason being is these clouds are moving through sort of slowly, but they're moving through. And if I take too long, those clouds are going to move across my stitched images. So I'm just trying to keep that shutter speed up a little bit. Hence ISO 400. Let me get to a shutter speed of 1 100th, which I felt comfortable with. And then, yeah, so what we're going to do here is I'll demonstrate, put a camera behind here, and I'm just going to work my way through, I'm going to overlap by about 30%, and I should end up probably, I don't know, six images out of this, maybe seven, which we'll take back home into Lightroom and merge, and I'll show you that in this video, uh, go over quickly how to do that. So yeah, let's jump behind the camera and do this. So one more thing to add here is remember to set your focal distance to one spot and keep that same focal distance. So I use back button focus. So I set my focal distance off over this direction. I set it and then I worked my way through the image and I did not press the button to do back button focus. So I kept my same focal plane throughout. Reason being is it'll keep the elements in the scene that are equidistant from the camera through each of the shots and similar amounts of focus and sharpness. So for example, even if I sort of mess up and my foreground is just a little soft, I sort of want it to stay a little soft through the whole way because if I switch partway through and make that foreground sharp in one of the images, when Lightroom stitches those together, merges those together, it's just gonna look off. So it's more important to keep that focal distance in a equidistant spot through each of your shots. So just a quick reminder of that, I forgot to mention that before I jump behind the camera. And that's it. That's how you work through panorama. Um, I think I feel pretty good about this. I did actually shoot a couple of them while I was here, just to be sure. Like I said, when you travel for a scene, I try to take some safety shots. So I tend to go home with a lot more images I might necessarily need. You know, we've covered a lot of things in this video and we made it sound like panoramas or there's so many things to remember, but trust me, I've shot these panoramas before and made some small mistakes. I, maybe I didn't overlap by 30%. Maybe my tripod wasn't completely level. And really the software these days is pretty powerful and able to piece together things pretty well. If I remember, I will show an example of one where I sort of messed up both the leveling of the camera and I wasn't covering 30% through each of the scenes. And we'll toss that in the video. You can just see it does still come out pretty good. But it's like anything. If you want to maximize your chances for success, make sure to keep those tips in mind and sort of follow them as you go through. But if you miss one, don't panic and think you wasted the whole outing. Give it a try, pull it in the Lightroom and merge them together. And with that said, it's time to pack this stuff up and we're going to take it back down the trail and we're gonna pull these images in the Lightroom and I'll show you real briefly how to sort of merge these together, look at the final image and wrap this video up. 
Okay, so now we're back in the office, and I'd originally intended to record this while I was out on the road and out in Arizona, but some little mix-up in the middle of the week happened, and it just sort of didn't allow for time to do that while out on the road. So here we are, back in Ohio, back in the office, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pull these images in the Lightroom. I'm going to walk you through how you build your panorama from those images we took in the field in Arizona. Lightroom makes this process pretty easy, and it's sort of my favorite tool to start working with panoramas in my workflow. So with that, let's go to the computer and let's put these things together. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom, and I've just pulled in the example images I'm going to use to demonstrate how to put together a panorama in Lightroom. And like I recommend for any kind of focus stacking, exposure bracketing, panorama, I like to photograph my hand in front of the camera and then do my series of what, whether it be focus stacking, bracketing, or panorama images. And then I, when I end, I put my hand back in front of the camera so that you can see where it ends. And it sort of makes it real easy for me to see what images are part of that blending that I'm going to be doing, whatever technique I'm using. So in this case, if you take the hands out, I have nine images here. And let's take a real quick look at them. I started on the right-hand side of this panorama, and I started far right. And then I worked my way over trying to get about a 30% overlap as I went through. In some cases, a little more, probably some cases a tiny bit less. And I worked my way through. And in my head, this is about where I saw the panorama ending. So I, this is sort of what I saw as the final result of this side because the sky started getting much brighter over in that direction. And I exposed for this part of the sky, as you can see up here in the histogram, I, you know, I'm pretty far to the right, but I'm still got my highlights in control. But I did carry this panorama over just a little more just to give me plenty of room when I put these together. So that ended up being nine images, even though at the edges of this, I probably won't really need those images, but I'd rather have the information to put together than not have it. So in Lightroom, this is super simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go start with my first image. I'm going to go to the last image, so the, the ninth image. I'm going to hold the shift key down. And I'm going to press that and that selects all nine of those images. So now I have all nine images that are going to get merged into this panorama selected in Lightroom. I'm going to right click on those nine images and in here in this menu there's photo merge and I want panorama. So we're going to choose panorama. Lightroom's going to think for just a second and it's going to pull up this screen and this is the preview screen for merging a panorama together. And there are a couple choices to consider here. What you've got here is you've got the type of projection. You have spherical, cylindrical, and perspective. Now, I typically use either spherical or cylindrical. Spherical can be a little handier if out in the field we talked about how I was just doing a single row panorama. Well, you could have done a top row, middle row, bottom row. Spherical might pull off a better result in that case. But with spherical, it's sort of projecting those images onto the inside of a sphere. And that's sort of how it works. Cylindrical is a little more like a cylinder, so you're getting a nice long wide move. Either one can work, and really I don't have a rule of thumb to say always choose spherical, always choose cylindrical. I tend to take a look and see which one I think is best. Here, I don't think either one's too different. Spherical feels a little squash to me versus the cylindrical where it gives me a little more height, something that I think is good. So in this case, I'm gonna go with cylindrical, but don't take that as a, a set in stone thing. What I recommend is when you're doing your panoramas and pulling them in here, just sort of play with both those options and see what, what looks good and go from there. Now, as you'll see, they just merged it together pretty nicely, but it's got these big areas of you know white note data. So there's a couple ways to handle that. An easy one is to just do auto crop, which is this button down here. You click auto crop and it just crops the image. So what it's done, if you watch, so down here I have this rock, down here more of this rock. If I choose auto crop, it's essentially just lopping off the top where there's white space with no data and the bottom where there's white space with no data and giving me a cropped image of the panorama. So there's a couple of ways to fill in the edges and sort of let Lightroom and build out the image of what should be in this white space. And it does a decent job. I just always worry it's going to cause a little bit of distortion that I don't want. But so as you watch here, I could do boundary warp, slide the slider. And as you can see, as I increase the percentage, it's filling in more and more. And this might be if you just want to just give it a little bit of build because you've got some important element you want to be able to include. If you crank it all the way to 100%, it fills the whole image. If you want to just do that super fast, you can just do fill edges, not even touch boundary warp, and it fills it in. In this particular image, it does do an okay job at filling it in. Again, this is one of those things where you probably want to play with both options, see which one fits best. I tend to go with auto crop just because I sort of want the image as captured and not worry about distortion. So put auto crop, but that's those are really your options to choose. You choose what type of projection, spherical, cylindrical. Like I said, I play with either one. Those are the two I go with most often as opposed to perspective. If you're doing more architecture type work where the building lines are going to be super straight, like city 
uh, panoramas, things like that, perspective might be a more valid option because it'll do a little better job at keeping things straight. But I usually go with spherical or cylindrical. In this case, I thought cylindrical looked a little better. And then how do you want to fill those edges? You don't even have to fill those edges. You could just merge this as is and do your own cropping in Lightroom itself with its crop tool. But you can use boundary warp if you just want to fill some of the edges, drag it all the way over to fill it all. If you want to just jump straight to, I just want all the white space gone, just check the fill edges spot. It'll take care of it. Or my slightly more preferred option, auto crop, where it just crops it in makes it look like that. So I'm going to go with auto crop. We're going to merge. I'm going to take Lightroom a second here. It's cranking along. And Lightroom's going to put these images together and it's going to drop me a new file in my timeline down here at the bottom. So it's dropped down this image here. We're going to open it up. So now I have this image. It's created a DNG and it has done some basic edits to it. It's sort of done its auto mode to it in order to sort of keep everything looking clean, merge them all together to make them look nice. I'm not going to dive into editing this, but the point is it's giving you a DNG file that now you can go play with your tone curves, your color grading, all of that things with the, after you've got them merged. So my typical recommendation is take your raw files, merge them with Lightroom, and then it'll sort of get you in a good place to start working from. And then you can make your normal edits from there. Like I said, whether it be color grading, tone curves, contrast adjustments, saturation adjustments, all of that. Now, like I said in the beginning, I went way far over on the left and I wasn't sure I wanted that. Still not 100% sure, but let me just show you. You can do a normal crop here. Bring it down like that. This rock's in. Probably pull that in a little bit because I got this rock sitting in there on the side. And there we go. That's the end image. And from here, like I said, you can finish your edits. You can export it like a normal file or anything like that. But really, Lightroom makes it pretty easy to put together a panorama. And that's how you take all the work that we did in the field to capture those images and bring them into Lightroom and merge them together and end up with your final file. And that's it. That's how you take that set of images. We worked on capturing the field. Be sure to follow those tips we mentioned earlier in the video while we're out there photographing this. You bring those photos back, import them to Lightroom, and you merge them through. Like I said, with most of those options, there's not one I'm going to say, always do this, always do that. There's just a handful of options. Just play with them, toggle them off and on, see which one looks best to you, and then go with that. And then once you've done that, you can do your edits in Lightroom, make any kind of adjustments that you want to make, and then you can export it and you have your final image. So hopefully you found this video on how to photograph a panorama and then put it together in Lightroom helpful. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see future landscape photography content from me, including tips, tricks, behind the scenes, mini gear reviews, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you for watching.